All right, we'll take your Bibles, would you please? And we're in the Gospel of John this morning. John chapter 5 is where we are. If you don't again, have your Bible with you, there's one next to the hymn books that you're welcome to use today. I see that our kids are making their way out to Children's Church. Thankful for the adults that are leading that and thankful that we have the, the time right now, the opportunity to be able to look at God's Word together and to study it and again to ask those questions. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? There was a woman who prayed every morning this prayer. She would pray, Lord, if you want me to witness to somebody today, please give me a sign to show me who it is. She prayed that day after day after day. One evening, she was riding the bus home after work, and the bus was empty. She'd had a long day. She was glad the bus was empty, so she sat in her seat and was just relaxing and praying. And the bus stopped. And the door opened, and the scary-looking big guy got on. And he walked down the center aisle, and out of all of the empty seats in the bus, guess where he sat? He sat right next to the lady who was praying. Well, she kind of opened her eyes for a second, looked over. She saw this guy, and she was immediately overcome with fear. And so she started praying harder. <laughs> Lord, make this bus go faster, you know? <laughs> she was saying, Lord, just get me out of here. Just help me to get off this bus in one piece. And the two sat quietly in their seats for a moment when suddenly that big man burst into tears and he cried out with a loud voice, I need to be saved. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. Does anybody know how I can be saved? He looked over at the lady who sat next to him. He says, ma'am, do you know how I can be saved? Can you share that with me? And the lady closed her eyes and she said, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> Have you ever, you ever asked for a sign? You ever asked God to give you a sign? I think that probably all of us at some point or another have asked God for a sign. We'd like that sign that's like down at Ocean City at the beach. You know, the airplane that pulls the sign across up and down the beach with words on it that say, you'd like for it to say, Here, this is Jesus talking to you and here's what I want you to do today. And it would be spelled out one, two, three, four. I don't know if you've ever asked for a sign like that. A lot of people do, and when God doesn't give them a sign, they get mad. And then there's people where God gives them a sign, and they are like that lady, they, say, they don't believe it. In fact, maybe they even refuse to believe it. That's kind of the condition of the religious leaders we're going to look at in John chapter 5 this morning. If you locate verse 31, where we're going to pick up, and we're going to see how out of all of the evidence that Jesus gave, out of all of the evidence that was present for them in their lives about who Jesus was, his identity, his mission, his purpose, we see that the religious leaders refused to believe. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't believe. And today we're going to look at the evidence for ourselves. And hopefully, as we look at the evidence of who Jesus is, that He is the Son of God, and He is the Savior of the world, that we would be wise, unlike the religious leaders, and that we would choose not to follow what they did, but rather we would choose to receive the evidence and believe for ourselves. Notice in verse 31, this first thought, that these religious leaders rejected the witness of John. They rejected the witness of John. Verse 31, we read, this is Jesus speaking. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You've sent to John, and he has borne witness of the truth. You know, have you ever noticed on those TV shows like Perry Mason and you know, Matlock? I don't know if you watch those shows. Uh, there's not much of anything that's good on TV to watch nowadays. So you start picking up the, the old TV show channels. And I noticed that on some of those lawyer shows, you ever notice that they never put the defendant on the stand? You ever notice that? And there's probably a good reason for that. If you were to talk to a lawyer, they're probably the lawyer could explain to you why they don't typically ask the defendant to speak for himself. 
One reason that I think uh, the defendant doesn't testify for himself is that what you have to say about yourself is not as effective as what somebody else says about yourself. You ever notice that? If you're in trouble, what are you tempted to do? If you're in trouble, you're, attempt, you're tempted to do whatever, say whatever, tell whatever it takes to get out of trouble. So that might mean lying. And people know that. But there's another reason. Quite often, other people see things about you that you don't see. You ever notice that? Sometimes people see things about you more clearly than, than you see about yourselves. And already in his ministry, Jesus had publicly testified about himself. And as he did, people responded in different ways to him. Do you remember back in John chapter 4 when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well? And he said to the woman, as she's talking about the Messiah's coming one day, and Jesus said, that's me, the one who speaks to you. I'm speaking to you right now. I am the Messiah that you are waiting for. Remember how she responded to that revelation? She went off into the town. She, she left so fast that she left her water jug there. And she went and told the whole town about Jesus. She believed, in other words. Her response was one of belief. As we looked at John chapter 5 last week, as Jesus openly declared to the religious leaders that he is God, the religious leaders got mad. Do you remember that? They, they responded not with belief, but they responded with unbelief. They refused to believe. In fact, they became so angry, the Bible says, they began to look for ways to kill Jesus, to have him put to death because he claimed to be God. And he chose to heal on the Sabbath in violation in their minds of what the law was all about. Some believed, some didn't believe. Some immediately received and others refused. You know, there was much more evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. There were others that testified to that fact. There were others that affirmed that Jesus is the Messiah. One such person who did that was a guy named John, John the Baptist specifically, who we're talking about here. Jesus, in these verses here, reminds the religious leaders of what they had thought about John and what they had heard from John. Now, you remember who John was? John was this kind of eccentric, weird-looking fella who wore weird clothes and he walked around and he ate weird food and, and he preached with power. And crowds followed him. Do you remember? There were, there were crowds that followed John the Baptist around as he was baptizing. And as he was doing this and preaching, he was saying to everybody, repent. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Jews thought, perhaps, that maybe John the Baptist was the Messiah. And they wanted to know. So you remember in John chapter 1, the religious leaders sent people from the priests and from the scribes and the Levites, and, and they sent this delegation to Jesus with the question, who are you? Kind of like what Paul asked that question when Jesus showed up in his life. Who are you? You remember how John responded? John said, no, I'm, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not that one that you have been waiting for. He openly confessed, I am not the Messiah. So then they said, well, who are you then? Are, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you Jeremiah? Are you somebody else? And do you remember what John said? John said, I am the voice of one who is crying in the wilderness to make ready the way for the Lord. Now remember in John chapter 1, on the very next day, we read that John had a crowd around him and he's preaching. All of a sudden, Jesus begins to walk down the beach. And John looks over at Jesus and he said, Behold, or in other words, pay attention, because here he comes. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that was the message that John the Baptist proclaimed everywhere he went. When he was around any crowd of any size, that was his message. Behold, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Messiah. He's the one that you have been waiting for. He's the one that you need. Pay attention to him. Look at verse 33. Jesus continues here. You have sent to John. He is born witness of the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. 
He, John the Baptist, was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. You know, it's amazing that the religious leaders looked at John the Baptist, and they got excited for a little while. Maybe, maybe this is him. Maybe this is the one. And, and they became excited about that. But then they come face to face with the one, Jesus, the Messiah, and what did they do? They refused to believe. They were willing to accept John. They were unwilling to accept Jesus. They refused to listen. They refused to believe the one, John the Baptist, who spoke so loudly and clearly to them. They refused to believe what he was telling them, that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John said, I'm not the Christ. Someone's coming after me who's much greater than me. Oh, and there he is. There he is. Pay attention to him. You know, throughout history, and even in our modern world today, people have rejected the evidence that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. People continue to reject that, and people throughout our world willingly, they foolishly go after and they embrace these false prophets, these false antichrists, these fakes, these charlatans who supposedly they believe are the Messiah. You, you know about them. You know, people like Jim Jones and David Koresh and Marshall Applewhite, and there's other leaders of cults that are active in our world today. People run after them, and those men led thousands of people to their tragic death with their false message. How could people be so, so naive as to do that? How could people be so ignorant? How could people be so stupid as to follow after these false messiahs? Well, I don't think it's an issue of stupidity. These people that went after them were not stupid. I think the issue is one of belief. That those who followed after these false messiahs, they wanted to believe so badly that that person they were following was the Messiah, that they were willing to believe anything. They wanted to believe because they knew that they needed somebody or something to save them. And today, people are looking for somebody or something to save them. Many people in, in our culture today think that the government is the Messiah. They, they think that the government can save them from all of their woes and their foes and their troubles. But folks, I would tell you that the government is anything but our Messiah. Because the government is made up of sinful men and women just like all of us. And we already know the Bible says that sinners can't save sinners. The government is not our savior. But in our world today, the, the Jim Joneses and the David Koreshes and the other false messiahs, they're still out there. And, and they're still roaming around looking for people to deceive, looking for people to devour, looking for people to destroy, looking for lives to destroy. Don't be deceived. The Messiah has come. His name's Jesus. The Messiah is coming again. His name will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming one day to take His bride away to be with Him. Are you part of the bride of Christ? I hope that you are. I hope that you know Jesus as your Savior. But if not, there's evidence for us that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. We see eyewitness evidence. John was one of the eyewitnesses. The apostles were eyewitnesses. They have given us that evidence that Jesus is who He said that He is. He is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Only Jesus can save you. The government can't save you. This world can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. The religious leaders made the mistake of rejecting the witness of John the Baptist. Notice the second mistake they made. They rejected not only the witness of John, but they also rejected the works of Jesus. We see that in verse 36. Look there with me. Jesus continues on in verse 36 with the word, but. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. 
You know, so far in John's gospel, he shared with us three specific miracles that Jesus performed. Do you remember what they were? The first one, John chapter 2, the changing of water into wine. Jesus did that at a wedding. Do you remember that story? And in John chapter 4, we read how Jesus healed a nobleman's son who was sick at the point of death by just saying, go, your son's healed. Remember that man believed and he went. And then we saw last week how Jesus healed a crippled man who had been sick for 38 years laying beside the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus healed him. And boy, that caused him a lot of trouble, didn't it? Because he healed him on the Sabbath. You know, by this time in Jesus' ministry, Jesus had performed more than three miracles. He had performed hundreds, maybe even thousands of miracles. How do you know that, Mike? Well, because the Bible tells us everywhere that Jesus went, every town that he went into, what did he do? He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He restored sight to the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He made the lame to walk. He even went places and he raised the dead back to life. We know that Jesus, by virtue of just his ministry alone, that he did thousands of miracles. In fact, it was, it was said that back in that day, everybody who lived in Israel either saw Jesus do a miracle or they knew somebody who saw Jesus do a miracle. That's how widespread the work of Jesus was, his miraculous, powerful work. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 36. To these religious leaders, he says, look, if you're not going to believe what John the Baptist is telling you, then look at what I've done. Look at the miracles I performed. Look at the works that I've accomplished. Notice in verse 36 how Jesus describes his miracles. He describes them as a greater witness than John. Do you see it there? Jesus' works, his miracles were in an even greater witness of the truth, of the proof that he is the Son of God. How could Jesus say that his miracles were a greater witness? Jesus answers that question. Look at verse 36. Jesus said that his miracles were greater because they had been given to him by God. Do you see it there? Jesus, all those miracles he had performed were given to him by God the Father. As Jesus was walking around and ministering, he had his eyes open. What was he looking for? He was looking for evidence that God the Father was at work in lives of people. And as Jesus saw God the Father working in the lives of individuals, what did Jesus do? He joined in. He joined in because Jesus said, I don't do what I want to do. I do what the Father is doing. And I've been working. Jesus would join in with what God the Father was doing, and Jesus would finish that work that the Father began by, in one instance, healing somebody who had been crippled for 38 years. Jesus was doing the works that God had given him to do. And Jesus was intent on finishing those works. Those works included healing, casting out demons, restoring life, controlling the acts of nature, Jesus was intent on doing those works because God had given him those works to do. Those miracles that Jesus performed were proof. They were evidence that he was the Messiah, the one that they were looking for. But notice not only the, the supremacy of the works Jesus did, look at the source of the works there. Jesus says in verse 36, these very works come from the Father. They bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. The miracles that Jesus performed were proof that God had sent him into the world to be the Savior of the world, to be the Messiah. You know, the, the religious leaders chose to reject the validity of Jesus' miracles. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, the religious leaders even said something as crazy as, Oh, he casts out demons by the power of Satan. That's how intent they were on rejecting the witness of the works of Jesus. You know, they said that the power that Jesus had to do what he was doing didn't come from God. It came from the devil. And later, those very people would discount the greatest miracle that Jesus performed, which was his own resurrection. You remember that? Th those religious leaders would come about and they would spread a story throughout all of the land that Oh, Jesus didn't, ra didn't rise from the dead. His disciples came around afterwards and, and they stole his body out of the grave and they hid it somewhere and then they started spreading a lie. That was the story that the religious leaders were telling because they rejected 
all of the works that Jesus accomplished. And you know, people today continue to reject the work of God. People today would rather believe in evolution than to give God credit for creating the heavens and the earth and everything in it in six days. People today would rather boast in the, the wonders of modern medicine and technology rather than acknowledge that God is the one who heals us from our infirmities. People today would rather say that, oh, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, rather than consider the possibility that maybe he is the Messiah, maybe he is the Son of God. You know, Jesus, he could have stopped there. The witness of John was good. His works were far greater. Jesus could have stopped right there. But he continued to confront the religious leaders with even more evidence. We see they rejected the witness of John, the works of Jesus. Notice the third mistake that they made. They rejected the words of God. They rejected God's very word. Look at verse 37. Jesus continues here, And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent him you do not believe. You know, Jesus could have stopped with the message and, and the miracles, but he offers more evidence. And he goes to God the Father as evidence of who he was as the Messiah. And Jesus tells us that even God the Father testified of who Jesus was. God the Father personally testified about Jesus. Do you remember in the Bible that at least two times God audibly spoke from heaven concerning Jesus? You know, Matthew chapter 3, at his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, there was a voice, God the Father speaking from heaven. Remember what he said? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father acknowledging that Jesus is my only begotten Son. Matthew chapter 17, at his transfiguration, as Peter, James, and John are standing there looking, and a cloud comes over that mountain, that area where they were, and a voice came from the middle of that cloud. That voice was God the Father, and he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. You know, God has spoken at other times about Jesus, and he's spoken about other ways, in other ways about Jesus throughout history. In Luke chapter 1, God spoke to Mary through an angel and told her, you are going to be the one who's going to give birth to the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, we read this, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God continues to speak. He continues to speak about Jesus to you and me. He continues to testify to us today about who Jesus is. Today, God speaks primarily through the Bible, through scriptures, as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and gives illumination and and gives us understanding about who Jesus is, what the scriptures say to us about who Jesus is. Uh, There's also times or there's also instances recorded in our day today, primarily in third world countries, where God is speaking to Muslims in dreams about Jesus and revealing himself through dreams to these Muslim unbelievers. And it's through those dreams even that people are getting saved and coming to trust Jesus and believe that he is the Son of God. The reason that these religious leaders didn't believe, we see in verse 38, was because they didn't have God's word abiding in them. The reason they didn't have God's word was because they didn't believe. They didn't believe in Jesus. Their unbelief had moved them to the place where they rejected Christ as the Messiah. And every time they rejected Jesus, here's what happened in their lives. Every time they rejected Jesus, their heart got a little harder. Their ears became a little more deaf. Their eyes became a little bit more dim. It was harder to hear, harder to see, harder to understand because their hearts were growing hard. And then it became to the point where they had said no so many times that eventually they couldn't hear, they couldn't see, they couldn't understand, they couldn't respond because of unbelief. Unbelief continues to be a problem in our world today. People continue in unbelief. The more you say no to the Holy Spirit, the more you reject the truth 
of who Jesus is as revealed to us in God's Word. The, more you, the longer you put it off, your decision for Christ, each time you say no, each time you say later, each time you say not right now, your heart grows a little harder. It becomes harder to see, harder to hear, harder to understand. And folks, that's true not just for unbelievers, that's also true for believers too. Did you know that? Every time an unbeliever says no, their heart grows hard and it becomes harder to get saved. But every time a believer says no to what the Holy Spirit is saying in your heart, you don't lose your salvation, but you lose out on the blessing of knowing who Jesus is and the blessing of serving the Lord with gladness in your heart. Because your heart becomes hard. Whenever you say no to the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Spirit and you grieve the work that God wants to do in your life. Not only did the religious leaders ignore God's voice and the witness of God's voice, but look at verse 39 and notice that they also ignored the very scriptures that they had. In verse 39, Jesus says this, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these scriptures are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him, you will receive. You know, the religious leaders back in that day, they prided themselves on their knowledge of the Scriptures. Specifically, especially, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they were the experts in the Scriptures. You know, the scribes were like the lawyers of that day, and their responsibility was, was to write down and to record and to transcribe the Word of God, the Scriptures. And they had a process for doing that, which was very detailed. And they were responsible for, for teaching and explaining the Scriptures. The Pharisees were the ones who, who they prided themselves on, on keeping the Scriptures. They thought that they, were, that they were perfect in their obedience to the Scriptures. If anybody understood the Scriptures, who would it have been? You, you would think it would have been the religious leaders, right? The religious leaders should have understood the Scriptures. And here Jesus confronts them with their ignorance. He confronts them with that very truth that in spite of their familiarity with the Scriptures, in spite of all that they read, all that they had studied, all that they had memorized, those religious leaders had completely missed the truth of what the Scriptures were saying about Jesus. You know, the Scriptures from the very beginning have spoken about Jesus. Did you know that? The prophets spoke about Jesus. The prophets maybe didn't name Jesus by name, but they named Him by title. And they gave prophecy after prophecy, hundreds of prophecies about the Messiah, who He would be, what He would do. And Jesus fulfilled every single one of those prophecies. In His birth, in His life, in His death, in His resurrection, in His ministry, He fulfilled every prophecy that was given in the Scriptures about Him. The religious leaders couldn't see that. They, they couldn't hear that. Verse 44, Jesus says, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do you not think that I shall accuse you to the Father? There, there's one who accuses you. It's Moses in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You know, even Moses spoke about Jesus. He didn't call him by name. But he talked about him in, in all, each of the first five books of the Bible. You see Jesus everywhere in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You see Jesus throughout those first five books of the Bible. Jesus is seen in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation of the heavens and the earth. Jesus is seen in Genesis chapter 7 in the deliverance of Noah from the worldwide flood. We see Jesus in the calling of Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. We see him in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 19. We see Jesus in the selection of Jacob in Genesis chapter 25. We see Jesus in the rescue of Israel from Egypt all through the book of Exodus. We see Jesus in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire in Numbers chapter 9. We see Jesus in the manna that fell from heaven and the water that came from the rock in Exodus chapter 16 and 17. We see Jesus in the tabernacle and all of its furniture and furnishings in the book of Numbers. We see Jesus in the blood sacrifices and the offerings that are described for us in the book of Leviticus. Jesus is all through the Bible. You just got to look for him. 
The tragedy was that the religious leaders knew the scriptures. They'd been reading, they'd been studying, they'd been teaching it. Their noses were so buried down so deep in the scriptures that they couldn't see what they were reading. They couldn't see the truth of who Jesus was. They couldn't hear what the scriptures were telling them about who Jesus was. Notice Jesus, what he says in verse 47, if you don't believe Moses' writings, how are you going to believe anything that I'm saying to you? What an indictment against those religious leaders. Folks, there are people today who've read the Bible. There are people today who have studied the stories of the Bible. There are people today who've even memorized verses and passages of the Bible. And I would say to you today, reading the Bible is good, knowing the Bible is good, but reading and knowing the Bible will not save you. You've got to know the author of the Bible if you want to be saved. You've got to know Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can save you. So today the questions are, who are you, Lord? What do you believe about Jesus? Do you believe the evidence that's out there for who Jesus is? The evidence that was to us, given to us by those eyewitnesses, by the miracles that Jesus did that were recorded for us? Do you believe the evidence that's given to us in the very Word of God, the Scriptures? Or are you not there yet? Maybe you've just never known. Maybe it truly is just kind of an issue of, I just didn't know. I'm, I'm ignorant. I just didn't know. But maybe the issue is that you're so buried in all of these things related to religion that you've never come face to face with the author of our faith. You've never come face to face with Jesus because you're blinded to it. You've been blinded. You've been, been made deaf to it. Who are you, Lord? Jesus would say, I'm Jesus. I'm your Savior. I'm your Messiah. I'm the one who you've been waiting for, and I'm the only one who can change your life. That's what Jesus would say to you in answer to that question today. What do you want me to do, Lord? Here's what Jesus would say. I want you to trust me. I want you to believe. I want you to stop rejecting all of that evidence, and I want you to believe that I am your Savior, and I am the Son of God, and I can save you, and I will save you. That's what Jesus would say in answer to that question. And then maybe the question that you'd say would, would be, Lord, what do you want to do in my life? Jesus would say, I want to change your life. And Jesus can do that. Our lives need to be changed. Did you know that? You might be living a pretty good life. Maybe you're retired and and you've got a, a big nest egg, and you don't have any debt, and you're just living life and loving life and enjoying life. But if you don't know Jesus, you've not begun to enjoy life because you don't have life. And maybe you're here today, and you're thinking, I just hope I can retire one day. You're just slugging it out day after day. You're dealing with problems. You're dealing with bills. You're dealing with children and their issues. and You're dealing with all these things. If, if I could just get to... I'll be able to enjoy life. No, you won't. You'll never enjoy life until you first come to the author of life. That's Jesus. The Bible says that none of us are good. So regardless of the good life you think you're living or how good of a person you think you are, the Bible says that yeah, you might be good according to somebody else's standards, but according to Jesus, none of, none of us are good. There's no one who is good. Not a single person is good. Except for one, that's Jesus. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, when the Bible says all of us, that's all of us plus one or two more, you know? That's everybody. All have sinned. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us even was born with a sin problem. We've all sinned and we've fallen short of the holy, righteous expectations that God has. God says that if you want to live in heaven with me, you've got to be holy. If you want to live in heaven with me, you've got to be perfect. If you want to live in heaven with me, you've got to be righteous. And you can't do that in your own strength. You can't do that in your own ability. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of being a sinner, the price that we pay, is death. God told Adam and Eve in the garden there, that on the day that you eat from that tree that I told you not to eat from, you're going to die. 
What did they do? They ate from the tree, didn't they? Guess what happened? They died. They didn't die physically right then, but spiritually, the Bible says their eyes were opened and they were dead spiritually. The relationship that they had with God, which was open and free and unhindered, became all of a sudden, now there's a barrier, and that barrier was sin. They sinned and they died spiritually. They fell out of fellowship with God. And every person since then has been born into a sin problem. We've been born with the sin nature. When you're born, you've already got this desire in your heart to sin. When you're born, you're already born pretty good at sinning. And we just get better at it over the years. Sin stands in the way of you having fellowship with God. Isaiah would say in Isaiah 59, your, your iniquities have created a separation between you and your God. Your sins have caused Him to hide His face so that He won't see you or hear you. That's what our sin has done. It's separated us. The wages of sin is death, but, there's a good answer here, but the gift of God to us, because God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life, the gift of God to us is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that we are saved by God's grace, through faith. Not of ourselves. Salvation is a work of God. We're not saved by our works so that none of us can boast about anything that we've had to do with salvation. That's God's work, and God chooses to do it because He's a gracious God. He's a good God. He's a loving God. We are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, not of ourselves. Totally a work of God. So how does that happen? Well, what is faith? Faith is believing. What do you believe? Well, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. So the word faith is, is believe. But it's more than just believing. It's also belief that's put into action, and that's where the word trust comes in. Faith has to have belief and trust hooked together. Faith always has something that is produced in mind. So if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that's saying, you are Lord Jesus and I am not Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Jesus being raised from the dead was evidence that he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that he is alive today. So when you say, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and I'm staking everything that I have in my life on that truth, that Jesus is alive, that he can save me because of what he did on the cross, and he will save me because he's promised to do that, that if you will come to the Lord this morning, and just confess that and to cry out to Jesus because the Bible says every person who calls on the name of the Lord with faith will be saved. So do you know that you're saved during this time of invitation, during this time of, of decision making? If you know you're saved, would you just pause for a moment and just say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I know I didn't deserve that. I sure am glad for your grace. I sure am glad that you would love me and call me to yourself. But if you're not saved or maybe you're not sure if you're saved, would you be willing to trust Jesus during this time of decision? Just to come to Him and give Him your life. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior. I know that you love me because you went to the cross and died there for me. And today I give my life to you. Would you please take my life, forgive me of my sins, save me, and make me part of your family. And the Bible says that whoever calls on Jesus will be saved. Would you call on Him today? And maybe there's some other decision that the Lord would have you to make this morning. I don't know what it would be.